Hello and a warm welcome from Berlin, Germany's capital city, to a very special dialogue between China and Germany before the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany, close by. My name is Andreas Siegwitz and I'm joined by Yang Ray, the well-known and famous presenter of China Global Television Network, CGTN. We have joined hands to present you with a free-floating discussion concerning the relationship between our two nations and world politics. It's an honor to have you here with your fantastic team, Ray, and I'm really honored. It's great to share this experience with you, which is a first not only for Germany, but also for Europe. We are making history, Andreas. Thank you so much for inviting us. And it's so good and I feel so privileged to be part of this very special program in close partnership with ARD here in Berlin. Yes, the world is full of uncertainty. That is why we should be cautious as not to characterize the current very close business relationship, particularly the strategic partnership between European Union, China, Germany as a honeymoon. However, the global retreat by the Trump administration from TTIP, TT, TPP and AIIB does provide Germany, China and the European Union a good opportunity to examine what's going to happen next. That's why with the G20 Hamburg summit around the corner, we have good reasons to discuss our collective future of European Union, China and perhaps Africa in the spirit of to shape or reshape sustainable global governance as well as to protect principles of globalization, free trade and climate change, right? Andrews. Ray, you spoke of a honeymoon, but our divorce is not through yet. But we have marriage problems, <laughs> which is mainly due to the big uncertainty surrounding future U.S. policy. U.S. President Trump has called German exports to the, to the United States very bad, prompting Chancellor Merkel to say that we cannot rely on partners as we used to. We have to take destiny into our own hands. Does that signal Germany could turn closer to China? That's an often posed question here in Berlin, but it's not for us to discuss. We have guests. All right. On my left side, first of all, is Charles Liu, political economist and founder of How Capital. Next to him is Dr. Chen Han, co-chief executive officer of the China-Europe International Exchange AG. Welcome to our special program here, gentlemen. And on the German side, I have Gudrun Wacker, expert on China's foreign policy with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. Welcome to the show. And Sebastian Heilmann, who is the president of the Mercator Institute of, uh, for China Studies in Berlin, member of a German-Chinese dialogue forum, which is funded by both governments as a measure to build confidence and mutual understanding. Germany has taken over the presidency of the G20 from China. Often the two countries seem to be competitors and partners at the same time. However, there are parallels. Where do Germany and China stand with regard to important G20 topics? Do they, for example, agree or differ on climate policy, economics and trade? Let's have a look. China's growth has a global impact no one can ignore. Whereas Germany's innovation industries are of big interest when it comes to China's global investments. For both Merkel and Lee, the topic of combating climate change is crucial. For further growth, we need green and sustainable progress. So China will continue to uphold its commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement. China's economic boom has been propelled by high polluting factories, power plants and traffic. Currently, China is the world's biggest carbon dioxide polluter. Last year, it released 28% of total emissions worldwide. However, the government is strongly subsidizing green technologies. Germany releases only 2.2% of emissions worldwide and is promoting wind and solar energy. But after closing down nuclear power plants, Germany increased its reliance on coal for its power needs, resulting in an increase of emissions. Fighting trade barriers is a G20 topic too, and crucial for both Germany and China. But Li's visit to Brussels displayed difficulties in China-EU relations. He criticized EU tariffs on Chinese steel. The EU demands wider access to China's market, where foreign companies are obligated to establish joint ventures with Chinese partners. 
ich habe deutlich gemacht, dass es natürlich auch im Bereich der Öffnung der Märkte immer wieder Fortschritte geben muss. Wir wollen auch, also setzen auch auf eine Gleichbehandlung ausländischer Unternehmen in China. Even wider differences in Africa. China needs Africa's raw materials to fuel its growth. Therefore, China is investing in roads, ports and pipelines. Germany's focus is to restrict irregular migration and keep refugees and migrants off EU borders by supporting Africa's economies. China and Germany at G20. Will their common interests outweigh their differences? Andreas, we do disagree. Quiet water runs deep. However, at the very beginning of our brainstorming here, I'm afraid we got to focus on common stakes that we share. Germany is the biggest economy in Europe. We, the powerhouse of the world economy, we are very dynamic. Uh, and we both stand for multilateralism under the authority of the United Nations. Uh, we all protect and benefit from the principles of globalization and the free trade. We are all partners and party to the climate change agreement in Paris. So we have a lot in common other than the beer in Germany. Uh, or the Mao Tai. We have <laughs> schnapps here in, in, in Germany, but I, I think you're right, Ray. We could be made for each other, uh, but we have to look behind the lines as well and see the realities of life. But let's, let's focus on the common ground. I'd like to ask Gudrun and Sebastian from the German side, what would be the foremost perspective and the best common ground that you could envisage for Chinese and German relations? Gudrun. I think we, we do have a lot in, in common, and Ray listed some of the issues, but I think the devil is in the detail, really. Um, for example, when Xi Jinping said in Davos that China is the defender of globalization and of free trade, at the same time we have to look at what China is doing domestically. So I think it will be arguing and having uh, to find solutions for this sort of where the div divergencies lie. Uh, we do have common ground, but it's very easy to agree on, you know, very high uh, goals Principles. like world peace okay. yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and we want to fight climate change, but the actual problem is how to find a common agenda and how to put this into practice, actually. Okay. And Charles Leo, what's your uh, statement about the common sticks that we can share? I, we believe we can share with the Europeans. I, I would like to come back and comment on exactly what you just said. Um, one thing that is critical is each side but understand the circumstances of the other side. The simple fact that you talk about <coughs> devils in the details in terms of opening the market, in terms of China allowing companies to come in and take over control, let's say in certain sectors, or as many in the West have talked about human rights in China, they have to look at, for example, 500 million people taken off the poverty line in China over the last three decades, according to United Nations standards. They have to look at what it takes to maintain a stable growth for a com country of 1.4 billion people. From the German side, of course, the Chinese has to understand Germany is one part of the EU. And there are some common positions and also differences among EU countries. So I think a mutual understanding is something that is absolutely critical to develop the strategic mm. relationship further. Before we go through it chapter by chapter, <coughs> Sebastian, do you think that there are areas where China could jump in because we lost the United States? I think clearly <coughs> the um, international strategic situation has changed with the advent of the Trump administration, with the withdrawal from uh, climate mitigation policies, also doubts about multilateral trade policy. There's clearly new necessity and room for, for collaboration between China and Germany on those issues. So to be very frank, in climate policy, if we wouldn't see um, joint leadership in the G20, 
coordinated between Germany and China. I think um, this um, international multilateral policy runs the risk of, of failing, of failure. And this is something where, um, from a strategic situation, really, uh, China and Germany have a special responsibility now in the G20 to push that agenda and to kind of sustain this agenda, even though the U.S. Um, has withdrawn from it for the time being, at least. So this is something that's really, um, from my per point of view, very important to see that changing big picture now. And um, there have to be new steps, there have to be new negotiations, there will be um, all over the place. I think it's clear that Germany and China have to take, um, to ad adopt the kind of leadership role on mm -hmm. those issues. Okay, okay, Han, before we go on to discuss uh, the issue of common concern, climate change, mm -hmm. let me ask you, do you think we live in the age of uh, post-US order where we, on the one hand, agree to disagree with the Europeans, but we have a lot more common stakes to share as we safeguard the principles of globalization and the free trade. Yes, I think China and Europe are getting closer, and we are both, China and Germany are both the most uh, the beneficiaries of the free trade, the globalization. So I think, uh, let's talk about the rules. Uh, the multilateralism. So I think in the G20 and the, the multilateral framework, we need to negotiate and uh, respect the rules and to improve the rules. Now, Gu Zhong, my first question about climate change. What do you think of the consequences arising from the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Pact? Will it be the beginning of a domino reaction? Do you think of this pact in Paris is likely to fall apart? At least at the moment, it doesn't look like that at all. On the contrary, I mean, the announcement of Trump after many weeks of going back and forth and finally announcing the withdrawal of the United States, there was actually the uh, reaction was to say, yes, we want to stick with the Paris Agreement. And I think China played a very big role in that. If we recall, U.S. and China used to blame each other for, you know, not being willing to do enough. Then there was this agreement between Obama and Ming. We saw at the G20 last year the ratification of both countries of the climate agreement, and now Trump withdraws. And I think the, the effect is the opposite. It's more solidarity. Whether this can hold is a different question. Also, I think we shouldn't give up on the U.S. too easily because the federal states, individual they states, have a very strong they have a position, strong yeah. uh, position and they like, see the mm. economic chances um, that China sees in fighting climate change as well. I mean, this is not only about um, fighting climate change because of fighting climate change, but because there are actual economic opportunities in that. Charles, uh, Sebastian said that uh, Germany and China must assume leadership now. But you have China with its emissions peaking in 2030 only, which will then be 40% of all emissions worldwide. You have Germany who has failed to reach its goals. So you have two sinners. Two sinners. How, they, how, how can you expect to lead and be credible? I, I think China um, has made commitments, and when China makes commitments, usually they follow up. I can give you the latest announcement last week. Uh, the Chinese government committed to 100 gigawatts of solar power in the next four years for poverty alleviation, not only for China, but also for Belt and Road countries, along the Belt and Road countries, poverty allevi alleviation. I've personally ma made a number of investments in the new and renewable sources of energy, and I find, number one, given certain technologies, including German technology. Number two, given China's market size, the economies of scale that's been created, new and renewable sources of energy has become commercially viable without significant government subsidies. If that continues on that path, I think in terms of reaching the Chinese targets, President Xi Jinping talked about reaching those targets by the year 2020 even the initial targets, I think it will be met. The shutting down of the factories in China, the creation of new zones that takes out polluting industries is all taking place. And it's taking place a lot, fa a lot faster than people realize. I have quite a bit of confidence that on the Chinese side, this will happen. Now, if the Chinese starts using, for example, in the case of Belt and Road in, in Pakistan, the largest single solar factory in the world, 900 megawatts in one site. 
If they start doing this on a global basis, I think it will be a very positive drive to mm. the rest yes, of the world. Yes, Pakistan is very hungry for power generation, particularly mm. after taking side with the U.S. Uh, to fight terrorism in the wake of 911. My question for you, Sebastian, is uh, um, what do you think of uh, the, uh, the road China place? We lead by example. We honor our promise. For example, what Charles suggests is that we are ready and prepared for solar panel. However, we, however, we face the uh, anti-dumping investigations, anti-subsidy investigations by both the Europe and the United States. At the same time, China is clearly aware we are the biggest developing country. And the one principle that characterizes the tacit agreement between developed countries and developing countries is that we should be common but differentiated. What do you think of the Chinese concern that may be somehow representative of uh, the concern of developing countries? I believe in that um, storyline that um, technological progress and economies of scale will be really important and China has to, to play the central role in that, making this, these new environmental technologies <laughs> affordable and also available to other developing countries. So this is one very important part of the, um, of the Chinese agenda. At the same time, we have industries in the West, in the US and also in Europe that have to compete with these economies of scale that are being built up in China, that have been built up also by, driven by subsidies also in China. And this is something that's clearly controversial. So I'd um, really suggest to, to, to try to deal with that in a more comprehensive agenda that deals just not, with, not just with climate goals and targets that we see that should be um, uh, achieved, but also with technological cooperation and making those technologies available as part of a joint agenda, a joint global multilateral um, climate agenda. That's hard to negotiate, but I think we must make progress not to kind of um, avoid um, disseminating technologies because of those trade quarrels that we have at the same time. This is really something that's really important because we have the opportunity now to, to disseminate technologies to accelerate climate mitigation through technologies, through affordable um, environmental and, and instruments, and this is something that we should go for on a multilateral level. Gudrun, we depend on fossil fuel or coal for up to 80% of the power generation, and that's going to cause a lot of environmental pollution. However, China says, let's import more green technologies from developed countries, such as Germany. However, the prices are very expensive. I'm not just talking about China alone. Developed developing countries badly need green technologies to improve the environment. What do you think of the reluctance of developed industrial nations to export the green technologies at a far cheaper price? Well, at a far cheaper price, that's probably the, the point. Public service, it's public product, it's not just <laughs> for making money, right? Well, I think there is the sort of inbuilt contradiction that on the one hand we have a goal that is sort of a global common good, which is the fight against climate change. But then at the business level, of course, you have competition and you have these arguments, is it feasible? Um, Return on investment is important to yes, businesses, clearly. Yes, this is mm. important. So uh, this has, is the contradiction that has to be mitigated, I think. But I, as far as I know, there are a lot of plans about um, giving technology and helping the least developed countries um, to give them the technology. I don't have a silver bullet for this, but it's a very complicated um, uh, problem. But I think uh, what Sebastian said about the having looking at the whole thing, that's the issue. And sometimes businesses, they look at their own uh, benefit and at their own profit, and that's it. Uh, let me go back to what happened uh, during mm -hmm. the Copenhagen round about mm -hmm. climate Low lying nations in the Pacific Ocean, for example, mm. demand the proper compensations for the climate change. They mm. say it's the early industrialization in the developed countries that should be held responsible for much of the global warming. Mm. And yet the low-lying nations suffer seriously. They need compensations. However, the compensation funding comes pretty slow. What do you think of uh, the grievances of those uh, poor small countries, Sebastian? 
to, I mean, they have these grievances, clearly that's a pressing concern, but historical argumentation usually doesn't help a lot in politics because you have to, to kind of um, achieve... Are you saying it's the domestic politics of the domestic no, electorate? Really. The politicians got to uh, take into mind the uh, concerns of their constituency and therefore politics is politics. All it's, politics are local. No, it's therefore about speeding you are becoming up solutions, more selfish, actually. right? It's about speeding up solutions, that's it. It's not um, talking about history is really not helpful in kind of... Uh, there's a blame game in the end, yeah? but we need speedy solutions for for kind of decelerating climate change, mitigating mitigating climate change. The sea levels are rising ruthlessly mm -hmm. and sure. endlessly. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, the future would hold for mm -hmm. those poor countries, Andreas? I mean, these are the common challenges we got to face up. We got to say no to global warming. What can we do financially to stem the yeah, process I, of I global warming? I think that everybody's realized that issue. Uh, we've brought China in. For me, the bigger question is what's happening with India. If India starts rising out of its poverty levels with that hunger for energy, we will rediscuss Disaster. this mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, but I think China, the balancing between the economic development and the environmental protection, from the point of view of the financial industry, I think the, in the recent years, the green finance developed very fast. Uh, especially about the uh, green securities uh, uh, issuance in China. We have a, a much bigger market for the development of green finance. In addition to the securities issuance in China market, I think there were established several carbon emission trading exchange in the major cities of China. Right. It's mm. a, it promises to be a big business, right? Let's yeah. talk about... Uh, Financial, 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 order. financial yeah. structures is a big topic at the G20. Actually, it's why the G20 was born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> During the financial crisis, 2008, everybody realized that yeah. G7 is not enough. You have to bring in the bigger nations uh, as well. So when we talk about that, what have we learned from the crisis? We will have to talk about China assuming a role in world institutions, which it hasn't managed yet, World Bank, IMF, etc., and instead focusing on its AIB, for, AIB, for example. How can China be integrated into these kind of organizations? What is your way forward? And I think China... Must China go its separate way, for example? Yeah, I think China has become the, uh, the largest trading partner uh, with Germany in the world. And Germany has become the largest trading partner with China in Europe, uh, in EU. So I think the, uh, 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 in addition to the trading cooperation, we are uh, expand uh, uh, to the area of the investment uh, cooperation between China and Germany. And also the financial cooperation, financial connectivity between China and Germany is more important than uh, ever before. So uh, you talk about AIAB, the International Multilateral Financial Institute, which Germany is the first one well, of the first countries to join and the major contributor. After the British. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we were, we were quite fast. Uh, you know, that two weeks ago, the, uh, the largest bank, the Deutsche Bank, as well as the DZ Bank, they signed uh, the agreement with the China Development Bank uh, to cooperate uh, for the uh, uh, international investment. Uh, so I think the financial cooperation is very important so to support the trading connectivity, the real economic connectivity. And also Ch uh, Germany is very uh, competitive and powerful in the advanced manufacturing industry. Made in Germany is, is means top quality, Excuse high quality. Excuse me, uh, let's focus on the issue yeah. of uh, financing. Let yeah, me go yeah. back to Gudrun for your comments on whether single currency should still be viewed as a convincing solution to a serious reform of what we call the seriously flawed existing international financial order. Because uh, what happens in Northeast Asia, for example, despite our disputes on history, geopolitical rivalry between Japan, ROK and China, we pursue further economic integration. And financially, what we can do is to learn, first of all, and draw inspirations from the European Union. However, the, uh, the single currency uh, has led to greater controversies, and if not to Brexit. What do you think of the role model that the European Union could play for your partners in East Asia? I was always skeptical to call the <laughs> EU a role model for anybody. I know that it What's has What's a role been model for peace building? Yes, I mean peace and stability, yeah. really. And also I think where the EU has it, its big benefits is um, 
to harmonize norms and standards and regulations. That's the big strength of the European Union. And maybe this is something that could feed into the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. The single currency, I'm not an expert on that. But it has some both flaws, let's say. So if Donald Trump says um, Germany is manipulating the euro, it's ridiculous because Germany cannot manipulate the euro. But other countries who are in crisis cannot do what they usually do when you have an economic problem, you devalue your currency. And these countries like Greece and Spain, they couldn't do that because we had the common currency, right? So I would say the common currency or a single currency is not the issue for Northeast Asia, for example. Mm -hmm. I think a FTA between uh, China, Japan and South Korea would be a good thing to go forward. Free trade Sebastian, what, what would be the future role of the RMB, for example? Mm. And uh, I think the single currency should return to that. I think yes. this certainly is not a good um, kind of um, suggestion for to, to solve these these problems of economic integration in Northeast Asia. But there was a good idea by the actually by the Chinese um, central bank governor Zhou Xiaotuan some years ago, talking about the special drawing rights that are underneath mm -hmm. the the IMF. And this is something that might be interesting to have a basket of currencies to to stabilize international currency relations there and to use this as kind of an, a proxy to a, a global currency mm -hmm. that is much more stable than what we see presently. So this is the way to go, I think, this kind of uh, fresh thinking. Single yes, indeed. Sebastian put mm -hmm. his finger on a very interesting mm -hmm. point uh, as to the interna internationalization of RMB. Mm -hmm. What Zhou Xiaotuan, the top banker of China, says is like, uh, we need to have a currency above and detached from one with a national sovereignty. Mm. And therefore, RMB should be listed as one of the major reserve currencies in the basket and, of and the it, special drawing rights happen. of IMF. And it does happen. It, it, it has countries. happened. Yeah, it does happen. However, uh, what about the opening up mm. of China's capital account? Yeah. Some policymakers, such as Yung Ding, argued strongly that yeah. the liberalization of RMB should go hand in hand with the liberalization of the capital account. Do you agree? And, uh, and and Charles, Charles, I've, I've, I've totally got the German side not agreeing. We'll take them in afterwards. <laughs> I, I also totally disagree. I think it's, <laughs> it's, I, I think uh, uh, if we look at experience of the financial crisis of Asia of 1997 and 98, and look at the financial crisis of 2008, we recognize global capital flows are torrential. They're very, very large, and hot money flows to where they can capture quick profit and the hedge funds and the hot money and China's entire financial system is not yet mature enough to be able to subject itself to this type of capital flow. Um, China has to think about when the free liberalization of capital accounts and free exchange rate can take place. But that does not mean that RMB has not gone out. 130 million, as you mentioned, Chinese tourists who travel abroad are actually using RMB cards or RMB payment norms, RMB payment forms. And are you suggesting that the massive outbound flight of the capital threatens to drain our huge forex no, reserve? No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> In in terms of so I don't trillion. have to have trouble about the debt crisis in China because you have this huge amount of foreign reserves? No, that's a different issue. The debt, pro the, the debt problems in China are serious and are being addressed just like the debt problem of a number of other countries, mm -hmm. including the United States. But China has a lot more, let's say, leave levers to pull in addressing mm -hmm. these issues than some countries which are nearly bankrupt in terms of Red, the red budget, you know, deficit budget mm -hmm. and so on. But coming back to RMB going abroad, there is a difference between RMB going out and free trading of the RMB, the, the, the complete free trading or the free, freeing up of the capital account. Um, last year, for example, $260 billion was spent by tourists abroad. In three trillion, it's actually not very much. It's less than one-tenth. But more than that, the hard currency reserves in China actually are increasing once again as global economy starts to come back. Now, I think the spending abroad by Chinese consumers, either abroad or domestically, 
uh, and China's imports. And what we what we're seeing is a balancing of the Chinese reserves and also a balancing of China's currency's global position. Um, 260 billion mm. is quite a bit of money. Yes, and sir. that has an impact In on the economies Charles. of Paris and possibly Frankfurt. Can well, follow-up question. Can I, can yes. I bring there is concern, Sebastian actually. in because he was exactly. getting nervous mm. on that? On the no, I, my, my question is to yes. Sebastian mm. very much in the same direction about mm. the debt. Now, should China, a serious partner of the European Union, take you guys very seriously mm. following the Brexit? following the uh, rise of a far-right movement in the, this election year. Um, Grexit was, in fact, a bad example that took place way ahead of the Brexit referendum. Now, you have this uh, uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, in southern European countries, and therefore we have good reasons to question whether we're going to have a reliable future of the European Union. Can we take you guys very seriously? Yes, you certainly should. I think because the resilience that the European Union says that resilience. the resilience <laughs> that the European resilience. Union is displaying <laughs> presently, not just in terms of uh, <clears throat> of um, economic policies, economic growth, but also in terms of um, financial. Um, and caution. This is something that really um, points in, into a new direction, in a more, into a more solid direction, also kind of political um, um, support that is building in France in particular and in, in the collaboration between Germany and France. I think this is really, a, there's a momentum presently that will push back those forces that destabilized the old European Union um, before the Brexit actually. So I'd be much more optimistic about that now than before. But about some concerns that um, the Europeans have with Chinese financial policies. And this is something that should be solved over the next few years because it contributes to, to global uncertainty presently. That's one important thing was capital account liberalization. And there was, um, at the end of last year, there was some um, reintroduction of capital controls in China for foreign businesses, which really came as a shock to businesses that relied on, on the Chinese government to be very calculable, very reliable on that. And this is something that uh, was, um, I'd say, a warning signal because many businesses, also investors, they started to have second thoughts about placing their money um, in China. This should certainly be done away with um, through reliable, solid um, regulation so that foreign investors can really count on the official regulations there. This is really a big thing because it's about trust in the future of, of, of financial regulation, something that should be solved. The other thing clearly, presently there's some uncertainty about the direction that um, Chinese currency policy is taking. So what is going on there? Is it liberalization? Will foreigners be um, part of the business or will they still be excluded? So there's kind of a back and forth game going on presently, which is not quite transparent. And this is one um, demand from many European businesses that um, this picture has to become more transparent and clearer in the next few years mm -hmm. to have the st uh, stable um, financial exchanges between um, um, Europe and China. And the other issue we shouldn't um, ignore it certainly is the debt issue, the leveraging issue in, in China. And this is maybe separate from the currency policy issue, but this is something that many, many um, people who know a lot about Chinese markets are really seriously worried about. And this, um, these are the issues that should be on the table also of the G20, because the G20, as we said, is, has been become important for because it was meant to prevent the next financial crisis also. Guzhong. Both European Union and China demand equal and wider access to each other's market. However, at this moment, the European Union still refuses to grant us the badly needed market economic status, without which we're going to still suffer from the use of a proxy market in the third economy to gauge, to measure if we are dumping our overcapacity. What do you think of the Chinese concern? Do you think at the upcoming G20 summit in Hamburg, we're going to constructively address this issue? I'm not sure that uh, market economy status, certainly it will be raised by the Chinese side. But mm. I think in the EU, you just don't have consensus on this issue. Um, the member states, most of the member states were against granting market economy status. You lost one of your biggest... Um, allies in that battle and that's the UK. Uh, but they are no longer the important voice on, on this issue because I mean they don't have the same problem that Germany is facing for example. But I think it, the, the D20 
debate between the EU and China is really, I mean, I hate to, to use these, you know, <laughs> slogans, but level playing field and reciprocity. This is really the two issues that are raised by the European side. And if you look, for example, as the restrictions that are still in place for European capital to go to China, uh, you need to build a joint venture there, certain sectors of the economy are off limits, so you can't invest there. Well, China already has a lot of bilateral um, investment treaties with several EU member states, and the European Union is quite open to Chinese investment. So. What we would need, actually, and it's being negotiated right now, is this comprehensive agreement on investment between China and the European Union to open up both markets, have reliable rules, and this is something that's in the making right now, presently being negotiated, and there's new momentum in that negotiation. This would be, because I'm always looking at um, solutions, actually, this would be a big step in European-Chinese. Well, we, 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 momentum... we see conflicting signals mm. uh, coming from the European mm. Union of uh, trade protectionism. On the one hand, uh, we heard that uh, one of the top um, household electronic appliances producers, Meidi, uh, successfully purchased uh, um, your uh, Kuka, Kuka. Uh, the uh, producer of uh, drones and uh, robots. On the other hand, the German government blocked our attempt to purchase uh, Extron, the chip equipment maker, citing national security as uh, a uh, convincing excuse, quote unquote. But we look at that as a practice of a trade protectionism. Do you agree that uh, we are facing this uh, uh, devastating barrier in, you know, uh, getting rid of these these barriers despite our entry into the WTO? I think China is very open to the foreign countries for the investment. For example, uh, Germany has in made an investment of more than 60 billion euros and set up more than 8,000 enterprises in China. For example, the top three automobile uh, manufacturers, the Volkswagen, the Daimler and also the BMW, they produced one third of their productions in China and they sell their productions over there to Chinese consumers. So I think China is very open to the German enterprises. And in the past, uh, I think, in fact, the Chinese government offered the foreign companies <laughs> the supranational treatment in the early years. But now, both foreign enterprise and the Chinese enterprise, they are equally treated. That's the change of the business circumstance in China. And therefore, do you guys think that the golden days of overseas multinationals in the Chinese market are over? Not if, acquisitions, not if acquisitions by Western companies are allowed in sectors that are closed right now. Exactly. This is the issue. We have yeah. this, this kind of very successful history, but now it's about equal treatment now. So, the, so that means that the acquisition, mergers and acquisitions business yeah. is really limited to a very small number of sectors in China. Well, no, I think, I, think, I think you have to look at I this. I have another number. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think you have to look at this from a historical perspective. Western companies went to China because of cheap labor and manufacturing. Today, you're drooling over the market and the market size. China is an extremely competitive place. For when Metro of Germany wanted to set up supermarkets in China, they found Walmart is already there. Uh, Gafor is already there. The local Chinese supermarkets are all already set up, up and running. The, Thai, the Thailand ones and the Singapore ones are also already there. It's a super competitive place. Now, I think the idea is that one has to get used to the idea that China now, for Western multinationals, is more important as a market than what it was important for in the past. So it's in a transition. It's just like what you were talking about before in terms of the debt issue, RMB, and so on and so forth. China is in a transition. The world is in a transition. You are a mature, the EU and Germany in particular, you are mature markets, mature setups, mature economies. You cannot have the same thing in China. For example, the stock market really didn't get going until the last three or four years. Now let's talk about specific sectors yeah. then. Let's yeah. talk about medical equipment, for example, mm -hmm. medical Insurances, technology, anything. insurances. This is something that's completely closed, but the superior technology still is offered by the West, and many Chinese hospitals want to buy it's Western technology, but they can't. It's in the process 
of being transformed now. I've made investments in this as, as a Western fund. I, I had a okay. dollar fund. Mm -hmm. I made investments in the healthcare sector since 2000. And Charles, this is the, the market economy status is not only a topic between, the, uh, uh, between China and the EU. It's also one between the United States and mm -hmm. China, Canada and China, Australia and China. Right. All have reacted differently. Australia has granted, but is still using WTO regulations to sort of uh, have anti-damping in place. Canada has used other measures, etc. With the EU, for me, it seems to be down to let's get concession, concessions from China to grant um, a certain status. And that could be e-mobility, for example, um, a big topic for German car uh, makers in, in China. Are we down to negotiating areas where we could find a compromise, or is that still far away? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, in very practical terms, it is down to negotiations in, in, in specific areas. It's, it's unfortunate because you have strong vested interests as well. People talking about, well, if we sold our robotics company, the EU will lose three million jobs. You know, you have this type of discussion that's coming out of the union, mm -hmm. coming out of the other vested interest groups. It, like, for example, in the financial sector, EU is certainly not a unified whole. Some of the investments that I've tried to make with the Chinese company in, in the EU meant going to individual countries and negotiate for two years and three years to get approvals. So we also have a number of problems on that front and it is sector specific financial sector in the EU is also well protected we are fo actually focusing on the issue of a self-fulfilling prophecy such as the allegation that an organization in the OECD countries uh, said granting China the market economic status uh, would mean that up to 3.5 million jobs would mm. be lost mm -hmm. therefore we see the growing signs the of a trade protectionism yeah. mm. on the EU mm. side mm. Yeah, therefore clearly, right? and, and as, as a result as a right. result of mm. your trade protectionism mm. China's export of a steel has been ruthlessly rejected mm. by the Europeans mm. uh, well, how can you expect the China US. to ground the bigger market shares you about see, we the have chemicals? entered we have entered the blame mm. game now we don't yes. make progress by that I think really we need new solutions solutions and progress on the negotiation front and the, this comprehensive agreement on investment has um, I think brings a lot of optimism to the table. I don't think and, this is a blame I, game. Mm -hmm. I think no, we are here to put the issues on the table sure. in yeah. the hope of seeking solution. All right? But I think we this still is the job have of the media. for the anti-dumping <laughs> issues we still have the WTO and as far as I know I mean China's track record to actually implement what the WTO is you know judging or uh, deciding is pretty good. So we do have a mechanism in place that actually works. We don't need to go into this blame game. And I think it, it never, I mean, the whole thing has never helped anybody. I mean, it's important to know history and to know where you come from. But if you just smash history into each other's face, it's not very helpful, right? So. I actually think now is a good opportunity for this investment agreement to go Absolutely. forward because we see a bigger preparedness right. because of the United States sort of reluctance to go forward with any multilateral FTAs right. or even withdrawing from some that have been in a while. Yes, TP, so there, there is a chance and I come back to that. I mean, actually we have the opposite domino effect of what was feared in Europe. We now have a sort of rally around the flag uh, effect in, in Europe. Due to Brexit, it's and more unified to, than before. Mm. Yes, mm. it's more unified. Well, uh, gentlemen, I think, if, if I think look, yes, yes, if go you ahead. Look, if you look to Asia for for a moment, I, I would like to know from our Chinese expert, um, what is the Chinese strategy uh, with regard to trade uh, in Asia, in, in sort of the, the windshade of TTP falling through, other agreements falling through. What is China trying to build regional. in Asia with its regional, regional. partners? Do you think uh, mm -hmm. the Belt and Road Initiative is the therapy that we prescribe for the whole of the world in allegedly rebuilding the seriously flawed world economic order? 
the crux and essence of a Belt and Road Initiative is supposed to be inclusive in our pursuit of a co-prosperity. In sharp contrast uh, with uh, the Obama administration that rejected deliberately China's involvement with the TPP mm -hmm. and they refuse, still refuse to join the AIIB. So what do you think of this sharp contrast? Yeah. It's actually, it's actually I, I would look at it very you know, from a pr pragmatic point of view. The rest of Asia, maybe with the exception of India, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, you look at Southeast Asia in general, and even South Korea, their economy is pretty much integrated with China's economy. Mm -hmm. You yeah, cannot sure. stop it in very practical it's terms, in very concrete terms. Semiconductors from South, from South Korea, from Taiwan, from Japan, from Singapore, coming into China to become pieces of electronic mm -hmm. devices to be mm -hmm. sold worldwide. This is what is happening on a very day-to-day -day concrete basis. And you can't stop that because the economic integration of Asia, some may not like to accept it, with China at its core, has taken a pace, has speeded up, in fact, over the last five years. But coming back to your, your point about the comprehensive investment agreement, I would just like to raise two points here. <clears throat> It's absolutely essential, but we have to accept two new things. The biggest change in the world economy in the last five years. Number one, China is now a net capital exporter. That is something which I think many people in Europe and the United States have been willing to come to right. grips with. Mm -hmm. right. Secondly, China is a massive market. Now, when we come back to anti-dumping and issues, people don't realize what economies of scale can mm -hmm. do. Economies of scale can bring solar panel prices down by 60% in two and a half years. And also battery prices will be down another 40%. So you have to accept China is a massive market that can create economies of scale. China is a capital exporter. So their interest and what they need to defend their national interest what they must do has to be taken into account You know, as well. I've been wondering aloud, uh, Sebastian and Gudrun, why the Europeans have been so quiet ever since uh, four years ago when President Xi Jinping first put forward the idea of a Belt and Road Initiative in Kazakhstan. The local media in Europe reacted very slowly, politicians acted very slowly and clumsily until 2015 when AIIB idea was put into practice. Uh, the UK played the leading role. The rest of the um, heavyweight members of the European Union follows to join uh, the idea of AIIB. And to my knowledge, the German approach to uh, Belt and Road Initiative is very much defined by, your by the geopolitical implications of this idea and by the sustainability of the Chinese economic expansion mm. through the platform of such as mm. Shanghai Cooperation Organization mm. in much of the mm. Euro-Asian continent. I share this assessment, he but, said, yeah. whoever controls the Euro-Asian continent mm. will control the future of the world, do mm. you agree? I share this well, assessment. We still have to yeah. talk about Africa, which we'll do just now. So there's another continent to be... <laughs> Well, Africa yeah, is also part of the Euro-Asian continent. Let's stick to over for a moment, yeah. Yeah. So the European reaction has been quite cautious, but at the same time, the Belt and Road Initiative has been taken shape slowly, carefully over the last few years. So this is something that really had to be um, observed, and AIB is seen as a success story now. There's a German vice president, so there's a lot of uh, first-hand <laughs> knowledge, actually, about the organization. This is being done prettily by people who are working with this institution now. Important. This is confidence building. This is something that, that makes things, makes the and initiative credible. Mm -hmm. And um, let me be frank, I'm very positive in that regard, that we need, for the world economy, clearly need expansionary visions presently, because what we see from the the U.S. is clearly really mm -hmm. withdrawing, is, is retreating, and this is something that's uh, certainly not in the interest of China, not in the interest of Germany and the European mm -hmm. Union, and so an expansionary vision like the Belt and Road Initiative is, is something that we are really in need of presently. So I suspect that in the next few years, uh, support will build up actually slowly, and this will actually be driven by reliable procedures that we see, and also by collaboration on certain pilot projects, hopefully in Africa also where the Europeans, the Germans and the Chinese can collaborate on. If this works well, this might become a huge success story. In the meantime, sure. we have a running train line from Duisburg to China once mm -hmm. a week for transporting goods. But coming back,
to Africa, which could be the next continent uh, where we see a lot of investment, industrialization, etc. It's a big topic on the G20. Uh, Gutun, from the German perspective, mainly because of uh, you have to help uh, Africa to get on its feet again because then people will stay in Africa and take their chances. They will not migrate to Europe. Um, the Chinese um, approach is a bit different. China is investing a lot in infrastructure, etc., also taking, of course, resources from, from Africa. Do you feel that these strategies could work with each other? to help Africa? Well, actually, to, to come briefly back to the Belt and Road Initiative, the e idea behind it Moderators is... Moderators don't like that. Well, <laughs> the idea behind it is also that development will bring stability. You need a certain amount or level of stability to go forward with the development. But if I understand correctly, this is the central idea of Belt and Road. You bring development and this will bring stability. Otherwise, mm. it makes no sense to go to Pakistan and pursue this sort of project, you know, this big corridor. And in a way, we see the same in Africa. I mean, there are a lot of... Uh, let's say, biases uh, against uh, China's engagement in Africa. But if you look on the ground, um, overall, there are a lot of positive effects. And it really also depends uh, on the country where China is investing or China is giving the aid to. Uh, there are some issues. Um, one, I would say, is that China usually pursues a state-to-state -state or government-to-government -government approach. And um, if China brings its own workforce, of course there will be local protest against it because countries, what countries in Africa need is also opportunities of employment. And if, if this is not included in the package, so to speak, there is a problem. I, I don't say that we have done everything wonderfully in the past and ideally, but I think that um, behind China's approach is, first of all, we have gone through this experience and so we give something back. And that development aid and cooperation has something to do with it's beneficial for your own country Sebastian, as well. I, I think the one China point implied in alone. the previous question of and regarding Africa is that we only take, 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 take away resources, uh, mineral resources or no, whatever. No, uh, it's, 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 it's a We gave. It's a we take that's and we that's gave. one of the biases mm -hmm. I was talking about. We take about. and we gave. Business. It's a balanced uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, there's also engagement in agriculture, in education. Mm -hmm. So this, this picture that China just uh, takes the resources uh, sucking them up li no. like a vacuum I mean, cleaner. I think the most controversial point true. here regarding Africa and China's presence there in the African continent is uh, whether China attach political strings to whatever investment or assistance to mm. the low-income economies in the sub-Sahara region of this continent. And that has caused a lot of uh, uh, debates uh, in Europe, for example. What do you make of the European concerns? Well, this mm. is where we would like China to come a bit closer, I, I suppose, because China is not has not subscribed to some of the international or the Western norms, let's say, on development aid. But Africa and I think there is a big interest of the but EU uh, to do things together. But it is a lucrative model for any African state, right. is it? Yes. Africa has oh. been a, also a learning case, a testing ground for, for Chinese um, engagement abroad. And what I suggest in, in several countries clearly the, this is that the learning process has been quite successful actually. Yeah, so there's a steep learning curve that we can see and conditions have been improved. More um, African labor is being used now and um, all the, the, the image of certain big projects now has, has improved uh, in, in, in many countries. So this is something w we could build on. The, um, the shared interest in, 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 in economic stabilization in Africa is to make it kind of attractive and safe for investments. Those countries that are being targeted now for partnerships in the G20, where certain countries are collaborating closely with, with developed countries, also with China. This is a project that uh, Chancellor Merkel is uh, promoting presently. This is a kind of new idea to, to prepare the ground for much more dynamic private and also state-supported investment. Why a recent front-page article of mm. the Financial Times uh, says China takes Africa as a huge testing ground to do experiment with, for example, industrialization 
and uh, helping create jobs instead of just talking smart about the rule of law and education. Oh, education is of course mm, a key to industrial mm, success, definitely. but uh, mm. you cannot just hopefully uh, educate Africans in order to keep them away from the shoreline of uh, European Union. I think that's to be honest, one major driving force behind investment, if any, mm -hmm. coming out of Europe to stamp the tidal waves of uh, asylum seekers uh, coming out of Africa. What do you think of uh, the uh, approach by the European Union? I think now Germany as well as the EU pay much attention to the development and the stability of Africa. And this is coincidence, coincidence with the uh, Chinese proposal of Belt and Road Initiative. Traditionally, I think China has a lot of cooperation, especially in the area of the infrastructure construction in Africa, and also the medical help, health and medical help in the history. But I think the uh, uh, the uh, uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative is a very open international cooperation. China proposed from the east and the Europe. Germany and Europe, uh, they co cooperate from the West with anyone along the Bell Road countries to promote the economic development, to create more job opportunities and the prosperity, in the meantime to decrease the imbalancing of economic development. Charles, you have invested in Africa as, yes. far, as far as I know. If you look at the budget that China is spending on Africa and the EU and Germany is spending, is, the, is our proportion, is it a drop on a hot stone? It's a, it's a drop in a hot stone. But I, I think your interests are different. If you look at the EU, uh, Africa has traditionally been the playground of the colonial powers which had Africa uh, over the last century. And Germany has not had a major role except during the Second World War for part of North Africa. And I think to have Germany taking a serious interest in Africa is certainly a good thing. But Germany has to try and work with others who are there. And in particular, I think China would be a great partner. Of course, based on what you said, you would like to bring China closer to European standards in terms yeah. of environment, in terms of labor, in terms of bribery and other issues. Um, no, those are issues which I think Chinese are taking quite seriously. They certainly are not going to shift their old uh, polluting industries to Africa. That's not going to happen. So I think what you're saying in terms of my experiences in Africa has been that uh, there's been a lot of sucking of natural resources out. But Chinese government has been very, very proper in what it tries to do in terms of infrastructure and health care and so on and so forth. But one also has to look at some of the other things which Chinese have done. This is not government. It is one million Chinese entrepreneurs have set up shop in small factories mm -hmm. and all these things all over Africa where hundreds of millions of cell phones are sold, which simple factories that makes plates. Thank you, Charles, everybody. Uh, we've been Great able to prospect. cover so many Thank interesting you. issues mm -hmm. concerning globalization, free trade, uh, the vulnerability and disadvantages uh, in this process uh, of uh, enjoying the dividends of globalization. I thank everybody for your very insightful comments on the common interests and challenges that Germany, the European Union and China are facing. We highly appreciate the strong and professional support of ARD in ensuring the success of the debate, the first of its kind for CGTN as well as perhaps ARD. Yes, we do disagree on some issues, but that's why we converge here to seek a solution. The conclusion of this brainstorming in Berlin will only be the end of the beginning. We CGTN welcome warmly you guys to Beijing where we shall host a follow-up discussion in collaboration with ARD. I'm Yang Rui. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.